And now, friends, as we continue to gather, let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude. Amen. Yes, good morning, good morning. We are glad you are with us. A few reminders as we continue in worship. We are celebrating communion this morning. It is World Communion Sunday, so we are grateful and grateful for and mindful of our siblings in Christ around the world. On Oral Communion Sunday, as is our custom, we will be receiving the Peace and Global Witness offering. You may drop that in the mail or you may bring it to the church next week during Circle of Blessing. On your check, simply indicate that it is for Peace and Global Witness. You can make the check out to Christ Presbyterian Church. We are gathering for worship this afternoon for evening prayer at 4 o'clock. would love to have you join us. Please sign up ahead of time if you can so that we have a list of all who are joining us. And a special thank you to Andy Hoke for leading our newly formed intergenerational chime choir in our introit for this morning. We're grateful to him, to the chimers, and to Carlton Hoke who recorded it and edited the video. If you'd like to invite others to join you in worship right now, you may hit share at the bottom of this post and you can invite your friends to join us for worship. 
And now, friends, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us worship God. Please join me in our call to worship. Now is the time. The table is set. Now is the time come from north and south and east and west. Now is the time. Let us keep the feast. <laughs> The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. So trusting in this gracious God, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy God, we so easily forget what you have done for us. We have a hard time seeing what you are doing even now. Forgive us. Give us hearts that remember your faithfulness in the past and eyes to see you at work even now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. hear this good news. The mercy of the Lord has not changed. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts to accept your word. 
silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this morning we find ourselves in the book of Exodus, which picks up where Genesis left off giving us a picture of Jacob's descendants thriving in Egypt. That was before. By verse 8 of Exodus 1, the writer tells us that a new Egyptian king comes to power. This king does not know Joseph. Time and generations have passed. The memory of the saving work Jesus did in and for Egypt has been forgotten. The multitudes of Hebrews are now seen as threatening. So the king begins a program of systematically oppressing the outsiders in his midst, using them to build his empire and keep them under his royal thumb. Part of his plan is to have all the baby boys killed. Some of my all-time favorite biblical characters, Shifra and Pua, gutsy midwives and a brave Hebrew mother thwart that plan, and baby Moses floats his way into Pharaoh's own household. After he kills an Egyptian guard for beating a Hebrew slave, a grown-up Moses runs away to Midian only to be called back when God cries out from the burning bush. After multiple confrontations with Pharaoh, numerous demands to let his people go, followed by plagues of frogs, lice, and hail, just to name a few, we find ourselves this morning standing with Moses on the night of the final plague, the Passover of God. So now as I read from Exodus 12 and 13, Selected verses from the Common English Bible. Let us all listen for the word of God. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole Israelite community on the tenth day of this month they must Take a lamb for each household, a lamb per house. If a household is too small for a lamb, it should share one with a neighbor nearby. You should divide the lamb in proportion to the number of people who will be eating it. Your lamb should be a flawless year-old male. You should keep close watch over it until the 14th day of this month. At twilight on that day, the whole assembled Israelite community should slaughter their lamb. They should take some of the blood and smear it on the two doorposts and on the beam over the door of the houses in which they are eating. That same night, they should eat the meat roasted over the fire. They should eat it along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And this is how you should eat it. You should be dressed with your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. You should eat the meal in a hurry. It is the Passover of the Lord. I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I'll strike down every oldest child in the land of Egypt, both humans and animals. I'll impose judgments on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign, be your sign on the houses where you live. Whenever I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No plague will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Moses said to the people, remember this day is the day that you came out of Egypt, out of the place you were slaves, because the Lord acted with power to bring you out of there. You should explain to your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're invited to pause for a moment of silent prayer and reflection on the text.
Amen. Way back in January, we turned the page on a new calendar. We looked with excitement to the year 2020. Barbara Walters' voice was everywhere as we lightheartedly welcomed the third decade of the 21st century. This is 2020. We bought calendars and planners and relished the optimism that a fresh year brings with it. And by March, the fresh calendar seemed silly, if not downright sad. Appointments and plans of all kinds were canceled or postponed indefinitely. It's been said that life is what happens when you are making plans. What does life look like when planning is not really an option? Now things have opened up a bit and yet so much is still unknown. How do we mark our days in a season such as this? The story of Passover is not an easy one. Plagues have come and gone, and still the Hebrew people are enslaved by Pharaoh. And God is determined to lead them to freedom, but Pharaoh and Pharaoh's army stand in the way. While most of us are rightly uneasy with the notion of an angel of God or God swooping in and killing whole hosts of Egyptians, the text wants to make it very clear that Pharaoh, who understands himself to be a god, is in fact an enemy of the one true God. Throughout the narrative of Exodus, Pharaoh pushes against all that God intends. He relentlessly wields death and destruction in the interest of shoring up his own power. And the text wants to make it crystal clear that the way of life, the way of hope, God's way, will not be ultimately thwarted by Pharaoh's death-dealing ways. Slavery, death, and despair are not the end of the story for God and God's people. I'm not sure an enslaved person would keep a calendar. There's no real reason to. One day blends into the next. An enslaved person has no say in how her time will be spent, no agency in determining, determining what will occupy his hours. At the time of the first Passover, the ancient Israelites have been enslaved for generations. These people have likely lost all sense of any rhythm of their weeks or months or years outside of the work that Egypt demands. And then God interrupts this rhythm and steps in to say that a new chapter is about to begin. It is ancient Israel's birthday, in a sense, the day they are born anew as a people. They are up to their necks in the before, the suffering, the violence, the seemingly endless cruelty and oppression, and God steps in to tell them that there will be an after, a new beginning. And he wants them to be ready for that after and to plan to remember and recall that after for generations to come. This month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you, God tells them and tells us. This is where before becomes after. From this moment on, God is understood as the God who not only creates, but liberates and redeems the God who authors the after for the people of God, come what may. One of my dearest friends has two birthdays. The one when her mother gave birth to her and the one when she became sober and went to her first AA meeting. I know of others who celebrate second birthdays of all kinds, when the bone marrow transplant was administered, when the abusive relationship was brought to an end, when she came out to her friends, when he got word that his adoption was made official. Both birthdays are significant, of course, but there is something deeply sacred about those second birthdays because those who celebrate can vividly recall a before and an after. 
They can point to the before, to the pain, the fear, the shame, the loneliness, the sadness, the grief. And they can point to and celebrate the after and the pivot point, the moment when before became after. Now, to a person, they will tell you that the after is not always smooth or easy or a piece of cake. And yet there is a deep gratitude for the grace of God that made an after possible. The story of the Passover, the first Passover, is written down and recorded much later in the midst of exile, when the people of God are wondering aloud if this promise of a life in a land of milk and honey can still be true. As we will hear in the weeks ahead, the children and grandchildren of the freed slaves will make it to the promised land after all. Their children will see the rise of the kingdom and the building of the temple. And for a moment, they will no longer wander. For a moment, it will seem that their after has arrived for good. But it does not appear to hold. The kingdom divides and eventually falls, and the people are scattered and uprooted once more. And it is into this moment that the writers of Exodus speak and remind the people that the world's timeline does not define their befores or their afters. God acts in the Passover, and that same God is at work to restore them and bring them home in the midst of exile. God meets them in their befores and gives them afters. Yes, there will still be those awful days we would rather forget. The ones when everything crumbles. The ones when we wonder if we will laugh or even breathe again. But the God of the Passover, the God we worship here and now, is determined to meet us in our struggles and our dead ends and give us a new beginning. That is who God is and that is what God does. Those are the moments that define our todays and our tomorrows. Those are the dates to mark and remember because those are the events that tell us who we are and whose we are. This morning we gather at this table as we do on the first Sunday of most months to give thanks for the saving work of God throughout all of history and to remember the particular saving work of God in Jesus Christ. This practice, this ritual, helps us remember that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. At this table, we recall that Jesus was born in and among us, not when all was right and perfect and pretty, but when the world was a mess. Even now, Jesus meets us here in the midst of our pride, our divisions, our stubbornness, our brokenness, and our grief to offer us the promise of an after. Not simply a ticket to the sweet by and by, but an invitation to an after that begins here and now in the thick of the messiest before. A colleague of mine wondered aloud this week about what kind of church we will be after the election. She noted that there will be grief and fear and anger no matter who wins the most votes. And she's right, of course. She raises important questions about how we will be with one another and what witness we, the church, will offer to a hurting world on November 4th and beyond. She says, my deepest prayer is that we will be the kind of church that pleases God first and foremost. After the election, we will be the church. Because we are the church right now. Our after has begun. We already worship and serve a God who frees us from slavery, who liberates us from all that would stifle us, who calls us into a life more abundant than any leader can promise, a life more free than any one nation can offer. 
God has already met us in our before and ushered us into our after. We have been given new life in Jesus Christ, the one who gives us his body and blood to nourish us here and now. We are the people of God in and for the world now. This God has already claimed us in our befores, no matter what shape those befores may have taken. And this God carries us into our after, saving us, claiming us, and deploying us to love and serve a world that is up to its neck in pain and fear and doubt and grief. This God gives us, gives the church our purpose and our pattern, leading us to act with justice and mercy and peace and love in a world that too often can only see what comes before. This month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you. A new chapter has already begun. So today we pause and remember and give thanks to the one who gives us life, the one true God who is the author of our after. And each and every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, together we proclaim God's saving work in Jesus Christ. The very one who makes our afters possible. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Our Savior invites all who trust in him to share in this feast which he has prepared. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, you alone are holy. You alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. We praise you, O God. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water, by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We bless you, O oh God. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. We thank you, O oh God. Remembering his love for us on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your Spirit on us gathered across time and place, within this meal, among your people, throughout the world. We ask your blessing on your children everywhere. Hear our prayers for all who are sick, all who are anxious, all who are grieving, all who are hurting including Hoppy and Terry, Joyce and Ken, Joe and George and Tom, Herb and Bill, Stan and Donna. We pray for the president and all who are battling COVID. We pray for Francis and Jenny, Helen and Deb, Kat and Steve, Paul and Peter and Gladys, Alyssa and Carmela. And we ask that you hear our prayers for those whose pain we overlook, or cannot see, and for those we name before you now, in silence or aloud. Bless
blessing, praise, and thanks to you, holy God, through Jesus Christ, by your Spirit in your church without end. And hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Eat, all of you, of it, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink, all of you, of it. For friends, each and every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, no matter where, no matter when, together we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us keep the feast. <laughs>
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to go forth into God's good world, trusting that God meets us in every before and draws us into God's blessed after. God is the Alpha and the Omega and is with us always. So as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and stay with you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.